Okay, so now we have a basic idea of how to build our polymers. Let's talk about the different kinds of polymers, starting with carbohydrates. Now, carbohydrates always have this ratio of one carbon to two hydrogen to one oxygen, okay? You're always gonna see this ratio. You could have three carbons, but that means you're going to have six hydrogens and three oxygens, all right? Now, simple carbohydrates are often referred to as sugars, but more complex carbohydrates are what make up the kind of structures of all kinds of delicious things like breads and pastas and rice. And you also find carbohydrates as structural components of many things, many things you may not expect. We'll get to that in a minute. Oh, uh, of course, the kind of most famous, at least in terms of biology here, in general biology, uh, is, of course, glucose, C6H12O6, which is one of the outputs of photosynthesis and one of the major, or the major input of cellular respiration, right? So uh, we're going to definitely see a lot more of glucose later on. Notice here, there's that same ratio of one carbon to two hydrogen to one oxygen. Okay, so uh, the uh, monomer of a carbohydrate is a monosaccharide. Uh, and they follow, again, this kind of same general pattern of uh, one carbon, two hydrogens, one oxygen. Uh, and, and they are usually hydrophilic because of the hydroxyl and carbonyl groups. They're also kind of, can be different depending on the position of the double bonded oxygen and the number of carbons. So you can have different configurations possible. Let's use glucose as an example. Um, one you've heard of before and one you'll see again later. So glucose can actually form either a, a, a linear configuration like you see down here, uh, or it can form a ring. And how it forms those rings can differ slightly. For example, you can have uh, an alpha glucose ring. You have two hydroxyl groups that are near each other. So let's see here, this is the alpha glucose. So you have the two hydroxyls that are near each other. While in beta glucose, they're on the opposite sides of the ring, okay? Of course, uh, the kind of structure, we'll get back to the structure and function thing in a minute here of what happens then when you change the structure of something. What do you expect to happen? The function's gonna change. We'll see how in a minute. Okay. Now in carbs, covalent bonds between, mo uh, between the monosaccharides are called glycosidic linkages. Sucrose, for one example, is a glucose and a fructose stuck together forming a disaccharide. So di meaning two, right? Instead of a monosaccharide meaning one, now you have a disaccharide that's two. Uh, and sucrose is a disaccharide you're probably very familiar with. It's table sugar. So what's the process they undergo to get stuck together? Well, they undergo hydrolysis. So they lose a water. Yeah, good. Now, polysaccharides are what you call it when you stick a lot of different carbohydrate monomers together. But what's stuck together and how they're stuck together, also known as the kind of structure of the polymer, affects its function. Surprise. For example, remember how we just talked about the alpha and beta glucose and how you can have slightly different configurations of where those hydroxyl groups are? Well, that seems to be pretty minor structural differences, right? But those differences are important, particularly when you stick a bunch of them together. Now, polymers of alpha glucose, you find in starches like potatoes and glycogen, which is kind of the stored form of glucose that we'll talk about in 116. Now, in beta glucose, on the other hand, when you have polymers of beta glucose, you end up forming cellulose. 
which is the structure that you see in the cell walls of plants and in chitin, which is the exoskeleton of fungi and insects, actually. So totally, you know, or I should say very similar structurally, just a slightly different position of those hydroxyl groups, same general chemical composition, um, but that slight difference in structure results in vastly different function, right? Okay, now, so that, let's move on to lipids here. So lipids are not considered true polymers. Why? Well, they aren't uh, kind of a bunch of repeating subunits connected together, like you find in carbohydrates. Instead, they're basically just a chain of carbons and hydrogens kind of stuck onto this other thing. Now, there are three different types of lipids. There are fats, which I'm sure you guys have heard of before. There are phospholipids, and there are steroids, which you may have also heard of. Now, lipids are, generally speaking, because they're just these long chains of hydrocarbons, they're not so surprisingly hydrophobic, right? So, uh, well, we'll see in a second here what that relates to. Okay, so the first type of lipid, fats. Fats function primarily as a kind of form of stored energy. And they're made up of a glycerol, which is what you see right here, which is the three carbons and the three hydroxyls sticking off the edge. Um, and then you have attached to this glycerol, these long chains that we call fatty acids. And you could have either one, two, or even three fatty acids stuck onto the end here. So and this is what it can look like when you have kind of all three stuck on here, you get, you call it a triglyceride or a triacylglyceride. Triacylglycerol, triacylglycerol. I call them triglycerides. I think you can try, call them triacylglycerols or triglycerides, doesn't matter. Um, but this is what you can get when you have them all attached to that glycerol. All those fatty acids, I should say. Okay, so how do we do that? How do you take those fatty acid chains and stick them onto your glycerol? What do you think? You're sticking a, one thing onto another thing. That process is called dehydration synthesis, right? So you use dehydration synthesis to add more of those fatty acid chains to the glycerol through covalent bonds. Now these covalent bonds that get formed between the fatty acid and the glycerol, we have a specific name for them. They're called ester linkages. And a triglyceride, like I said, is kind of a storage form of fat where those glycerols are fully filled up. They have all their hydroxyls have been used to kind of form these ester linkages, okay? Now, depending on what kind of chains you have, they can actually change the function or the properties of that lipid, of that fat. For example, you could have uh, saturated fats where the fatty acids are saturated. Saturated meaning that they're, each carbon has the maximum number of hydrogens attached to it that it can have. So you can see here on this uh, image, it's just carbons and hydrogens all the way down. Now this is different obviously than unsaturated fats where you have instead of lots of hydrogens all the way through, you actually have double bonding between one or more of the carbons in this chain. Now this double bonding can result in actually kind of a, a, a shape change where instead of these long linear chains like you'd see in the saturated fats, you can actually have kinks or bends in the chains. So what does this do for the functional or, or properties of this? Well, um, I'm sure you guys have all heard saturated fats or unsaturated fats, like, oh, don't eat those saturated fats, they're not good for you. Well, this is why, okay? So saturated fats, because they have these more standardized form, they actually stack very evenly and consistently. So that means that they have um, a higher 
melting point. So they are need to be hotter for them to dissolve or these kind of structure to fall apart. So that's why, you know, butter, for example, is a saturated fat because at room temperature, it maintains its structure. As opposed to, say, uh, olive oil, it's an unsaturated fat. It has more double bonds in its fatty acids, meaning it has a less rigid structure that it can maintain. So it has a more liquid, uh, you know, structure at room temperature. Okay, so those are uh, fatty acids, fatty chains. Now, another structure that we can come across with fats are phospholipids. Now, phospholipids, you can find these in cell membranes, and they consist of a glycerol with a fatty acid sticking off, or excuse me, sorry, a glycerol with a phosphate sticking off one end. And then on the other side is actually the fatty acids. So the glycerol and the two fatty acids are considered hydrophobic, right? They're moving away from the water. Well, that phosphate group that's sticking off on the other side of the glycerol, that's actually considered hydrophilic. So you have kind of a funky structure here where you have one side of the structure is hydrophobic, wants to move away from water, and the other side is hydrophilic and wants to move towards water. So what do you think happens when you add it to water? Any guesses? You actually end up with this kind of spontaneous phospholipid bilayer, okay? So the hydrophilic heads of a phospholipid are gonna to move towards the outside to be near water, while the hydrophobic tails move to the inside to stay away from water. So like this white space out here, we can pretend that's water, right? And this is what's gonna happen. So this is hugely important. Uh, we'll see later on, it's hugely important for structures of cell membranes that we're gonna talk about in a couple lectures. Okay, uh, finally, steroids are the kind of last type of lipid that we talked about. And steroids are made up of three rings of six carbons and one five carbon ring, with usually with a kind of chain sticking off the end, as well as usually some kind of functional groups added here or there. Now, cholesterol is kind of the most famous or common type of steroid, the one you've probably heard the most about. It's actually used as a precursor for a lot of hormones, as well as structural component of a lot of animal cell membranes. We'll talk about that again later on.